This is AutoLine Daily, the show dedicated to enthusiasts of the global automotive industry. Automakers are really getting focused on restarting their manufacturing operations in Europe and North America, borrowing a lot of ideas that they use getting their operations going again in China. In fact, the UAW just approved safety protocols at Ford and FCA to reopen their plants in the U.S. on May 18th. General Motors sent notice to its suppliers that it's going to resume V6 engine production at its plant in St. Catharines in Canada on May 11th, which means that suppliers have to start production this week. And GM and BMW seem to be weathering this crisis, at least financially, better than other major manufacturers. GM sold 770,000 vehicles worldwide in the first quarter, down less than 10%. It posted nearly $33 billion in revenue, which is down only 6%. And it made an operating profit of $700 million and a net profit of $300 million. Amazingly, General Motors made an EBIT profit of $2.2 billion in North America. BMW reported that its sales fell 20%, to 477,000 vehicles, but even so, its revenue actually went up 3.5% to just over 23 billion euros. But that was mainly due to an improvement in its financial services and by an accounting tool that reduced what they call eliminations, or sales between business units within the group. Car and motorcycle revenue was actually down. But BMW was able to post a 574 million euro net profit, and that was down only 2.4% from the year before. And it was actually three and a half times better than the profit that Daimler posted. But don't get too excited about these numbers. Remember, GM and BMW's and Daimler's operations were still open for part of the first quarter, so Q2 numbers will likely be a lot worse. BMW warns that it's going to be a tough year with no quick recovery. It's especially worried about a second wave of COVID-19 and a global recession, and it warns, and I quote here, there will be no swift recovery. But there is one bright spot in the European market, and it's all got to do with electric cars. Yesterday, we reported that the UK saw a 97% drop in new vehicle registrations last month, but BEVs were down only 10%, and they accounted for an amazing 32% of all registrations. The Tesla Model 3 and the Jaguar I-Pace were the top-selling models last month. But the solid performance had more to do with fulfilling orders from previous months, so we'll have to wait and see how demand was impacted by the coronavirus. Even so, UK EV sales are expected to double this year, because of the number of new models that are being introduced. And one of those new models is going to be an SUV from the Chinese automaker BYD. It plans to bring a full range of BEVs to Europe this year, starting with the Tang SUV in Norway. That vehicle has a 420 kilometer or roughly 260 mile range, but pricing will be announced later this year. BYD also offers a range of electric trucks and vans including a small panel van, a yard tractor, and a semi. <music> Connected cars are going to make cars and roads a lot safer and a lot more efficient. That's why a group of European companies and research institutions launched the 5G Net Mobile project three years ago to test 5G vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle and vehicle-to-infrastructure communication. Some of the companies involved include Bosch, BMW, VW, and Nokia. In addition to testing passenger vehicles, the project demonstrated how the technology can be used to protect pedestrians at crosswalks, commercial vehicle platooning, and even side-by-side -side platooning of grain harvesters. The results of the project will be used to standardize specifications, develop new business models, and help pave the way for mass production. BMW is ending a program that allowed North American customers to go pick up their new car in Germany. Even though it was a great deal, not enough people were choosing its European delivery program. Here's how it worked. 
you took delivery of your car right next to BMW's headquarters. They knocked 5% off the base price. You got a tour of the plant, free admission to the BMW Museum, free pickup and delivery from the airport, and all shipping costs of the car back to North America. A lot of people who took advantage of the program doubled it up with a vacation in Europe. BMW will officially end the program to North American customers in September, but you can still get in on it if you fill out a pre-reservation form by May 18th. Fewer people were choosing the service because BMW launched a similar program called the Ultimate Delivery Experience at its U.S. plant in South Carolina. It offers many of the same amenities as the European program, but is available for any production BMW vehicle, not just the ones at that plant. And if you've ever wondered how Audi goes about designing its vehicles, here's your chance. The company is launching an interactive live stream called Insight Audi Design that shares insights into its design process. You can customize what you want to learn about, and a tour guide will explain the company's design philosophy and answer any questions that you have. The virtual tours are about 20 minutes long, and best of all, they're free. It's currently only available in German, but an English version is coming soon. And if you want to check it out, just head on over to www.audi.stream. And Lamborghini is bringing its newest model right to you. The performance vehicle manufacturer is using augmented reality for the virtual launch of the convertible version of the Huracan EVO. That car is powered by a V10 engine that makes 640 horsepower and is able to do 0 to 100 kilometers an hour in only 3.1 seconds. To experience the augmented reality feature, go to the Lamborghini website and tap on the icon that says C in AR. With an approved iPhone or iPad, anyone can check out the interior or exterior on a one-to-one -one scale and take pictures of the car in your own driveway. Lambo says it will soon have all its vehicles available in AR. Auto Line Daily is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires. Your journey, our passion. Last week I test drove a Hyundai Sonata Hybrid and I pointed out that there are actually two different fuel economy gauges on the car. One in the instrument cluster and the other at the top of the center stack. And I also pointed out that each gauge had a slightly different MPG readout. With the one in the cluster always a bit more optimistic by a few tenths of a mile per gallon. So Mike Evanoff, the product strategy manager at Hyundai Motor America, contacted us to explain the discrepancy. Here's what he had to say. Cluster MPG average is based on current drive. This will reset after key cycle that allows the ECU to reset, i.e. turn the vehicle off at night and return in the morning. The navigation MPG average display is calculated based on the last refueling, regardless of any key cycling. I think depending on which menu is selected on the cluster display, you can see MPG average from the last refueling as well as current drive MPG. Well, now we know the answer. So let's get to this week's test drive, the Toyota Camry TRD. You heard me right, a performance version of what's always been a nondescript, plain vanilla, mid-size family sedan. But even Toyota came to realize that with sales of sedans dropping in the U.S. market, it had to sprinkle some excitement on its franchise nameplate. And why not the Camry? After all, it won three of the last five NASCAR Cup championships. And the TRD Camry certainly looks the part of a performance car. With a splitter that juts out at the bottom of the front fascia, aero spats that attach to the rocker panels, and of course that big black wing on the back. All that plus a contrasting two-tone paint job and black alloy wheels. But under the hood, you don't get anything special. It's the same 3.5 liter V6 and 8-speed automatic that's available in other trim lines of the Camry. Not that the engine is a slouch. It puts out 301 horsepower and 267 pound-feet of torque. But in my book, a proper performance car really requires more get-up-and-go than its stablemates if it's going to have any street cred. 
where the TRD does leave the rest of the Camry line behind is in the chassis tuning. It gets special TRD shocks, stiffer springs, bigger sway bars, and larger front brakes with dual piston calipers. It also gets 235-40 R19 summer tires. But while Toyota's literature says they're Bridgestone Potenzas, the one that I test drove came with Michelin green X's. You can feel the chassis tuning of this car as soon as you get out on the street. It turns in faster, corners with a lot less body roll, and comes to a stop more quickly with much better pedal modulation than other Camrys. There's also a sport mode setting, which seems to crack the throttle open faster and downshift quicker. But it's a rough riding car, and you feel every imperfection in the pavement. Inside the cabin, you get somewhat sporty design cues, like a leather wrap steering wheel, red stitching on the seats and door trim, red seat belts, and TRD logos on the shift knob and floor and trunk mats. Okay, here's my bottom line. It's not a bad car to drive and actually encourages you to pick up your pace and get going. But I'm kind of hoping that this is just Toyota sticking its toe in the water to see what it can do with a TRD Camry. If it's serious, the next step is to put more ponies in the engine compartment add some MR shocks at the corners, and give the seats bigger bolstering. If the TRD badge is really going to stand for something, there's still more up to go. And with that, we wrap up today's report. Thanks for watching. We'll see you here again tomorrow.